all so much for uh, joining us this evening for tonight's program, How to Plant a Garden for Pollinators. i uh, got a lot of folks tuning in tonight, so I'm so glad that you could join us this evening for tonight's program. Uh, my name is Pat Kane, Public Programs Visitor Services Coordinator at the Museum of the Grand Prairie, part of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District. And I want to give a special thank you to Jill Taylor, tonight's special guest, um, uh, giving our presentation uh, tonight on how to design a garden for uh, pollinators, uh, part of our garden speaker series. Uh, before we get into tonight's program, I, uh, I want to go over a few housekeeping items, um, let you know about what's coming up at the museum and, and County Forest Preserve District, um, and, um, and, and then we'll get into tonight's program. So first and foremost, if you haven't done so already, let us know where you're watching from by uh, writing down in the comments section uh, below where you're watching from. Got quite a few of you tuning in uh, who have already done that. So thank you so much. We've got Joanne tuning in from Peoria, Jay from right here in Champaign County in Urbana, Leslie from Muhammad, uh, Donna from St. John, Indiana, Cynthia from Texas, Alexis from Virginia, Carolyn from Canada, uh, Don from Missouri, uh, Carol uh, from Illinois, uh, Danville, Illinois, Hope from Germantown, Tennessee, and so much more. Thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. Really, really appreciate it. Um, should you have any questions tonight, the comment section is a good spot for you. Um, write any questions you have in the comment section and we'll answer uh, questions uh, uh, with Jill uh, at the end of tonight's program. A little bit about us, if you don't know anything about us, uh, Museum of the Grand Prairie opened at, originally as the Early American Museum in 1968, and our uh, current mission is to collect, preserve, and interpret the cultural and natural history of Champaign County and surrounding East Central Illinois. We're located in East Central Illinois in Champaign County um, in Mahat at Lake of the Woods Forest Preserve. We're part of uh, Champaign County Forest Preserve District, um, uh, and uh, uh, CCFPD consists of seven beautiful forest preserves right here in Champaign County, uh, educational facilities, including our museum, uh, the Homer Lake Interpretive Center, Homer Lake Forest Reserve, uh, Lake of the Woods Golf Course, Kickapoo Rail Trail, and so much more. Um, so if you have an opportunity uh, this spring, uh, get out to your local forest preserves, whether that's here in Champaign County or wherever you are from, take advantage of those natural beauties right in your own backyard. Uh, tonight's program is the third installment in our annual garden speaker series, and the series is virtual this year for the first time ever, uh, beginning in January this year and going into April next month, uh, we've had a monthly speaker present in the series. And the theme for this year's series is how to at home. Uh, with the large amount of time everyone is spending at home these days, we thought that would be a very appropriate theme for this year's garden speaker series. Uh, with the um, uh, programs focusing on how to garden in various ways within your own home. Uh, we had a couple of great programs in January and February, one discussing how to design a garden to attract birds, um, and the other exploring the diversity of native plants in our area here in central Illinois in the Midwest, and how to incorporate those into your own backyards. Um, check out the recordings of those programs on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Um, uh, and uh, of course, we have tonight's program showing you how to plant a garden for pollinators. And our final program in the series will be next month, um, April 22nd, Thursday, April 22nd at seven o'clock Central Standard Time, where MJ Oviat, another Champaign County Master Gardener, uh, will present a program titled How to Start Your Own Tea Garden. Um, again, that program is at seven o'clock right here live on our Facebook and YouTube pages here at the Museum of the Grand Prix. Uh, other things coming up uh, with us. If you're local, if you're local to the central Illinois area, um, we encourage you to come visit us at the Museum of the Grand Prairie and Homer Lake Interpretive Center. Uh, we reopened um, at the beginning of this month. Homer Lake Interpretive Center is open from 1 to 5 p.m. Tuesday through Friday. And the Museum of the Grand Prairie is open Tuesday through Saturday from 1 to 5 p.m. And we ask folks to register in advance. Um, uh, if you're looking for things to do this upcoming spring uh, with uh, uh, folks of all ages, uh, the Forest Preserve District, we're putting out a spring exploration activity guide. Um, and we'll have paper copies available at Forest Preserves here in Central Illinois, as well as copies that you can find at ccfpd.org. Um, and so spring is coming uh, and we encourage you to head outside, look for signs of spring using this activity guide. 
It'll feature information uh, talking about wildflowers, migrating birds, and uh, the return of butterflies, which I know many of us are interested in tonight. So you can, as I mentioned, you can download that spring activity guide beginning on March 22nd at um, uh, ccfpd.org. And, uh, or you could uh, pick those up at uh, local forest preserves here in Champaign County. Um, International Dark Sky Week is coming up uh, April 5th through the 12th this year. Um, and we're celebrating by, uh, one thing we're doing is holding a virtual event titled Light Pollution, How It Affects You and What You Can Do About It. Um, uh, Dave Leak, retired director of the William M. Sparkle Planetarium at Parkland College is gonna talk all about why International Dark Sky Week exists, activities you can do to celebrate it, and what you can do to contribute to the international cause and how you can enjoy the beautiful natural resource that is our night sky. And we also encourage you to venture out to Illinois first International Dark Sky Park Middle Fork River Forest Preserve right here in the Champaign County Forest Preserve District to appreciate the night sky in one of Champaign County's darkest locations. Um, uh, that program is gonna happen on Wednesday, April 7th, streaming live on the Champaign County Forest Preserve District Facebook and YouTube pages. Uh, for more info about all these programs and everything else happening at the Museum of the Grand Prairie and Champaign County Forest Preserve District, uh, we encourage you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or visit museumofthegrandprairie.org or ccfpd.org. Again, let us know where you're watching from tonight. Write that down in the comment section below. Thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. Love to see you all uh, this evening virtually. Um, and if you have any questions, please write those down in the comment section and we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can at the end of the program. Might not have time to answer all of them, but we'll do our best. So uh, enough of me talking, I'm gonna bring on our special guest, Jill Taylor. I'm gonna add her to the live stream here. Hey, Jill. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Hi, everyone. Hey, Jill. Okay, great. Um, uh, uh, Jill is, I'm going to turn it over to yeah. Jill Taylor. Can you hear me uh, okay? She's been with, yes, we can. Yes, we can. Uh, Jill has been with Champaign County Master Gardener oh, since. Are we having trouble again? Uh, can I think there's a tiny lag, Jill, but I think we can make do with it. Um, uh, so Jill has been with Champaign County Master Gardener since 2019, oh, and while she works uh, mainly with tropical plants, um, uh, she also maintains the pollinator garden okay. at Crisis Nursery here in Urbana, Illinois. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Jill. Jill, if you wanted to share your screen, um, and I will turn it over to you. Sure. Okay. Let's see. Oh, shoot. Uh, one moment. I think I've lost it. <laughs> That's all right. Okay, let's try this again. Okay, there we go. There. You know what? Okay. Okay, so we're tonight we're going to talk about planting for pollinators. The so today we're talking about who the pollinators are and what leaders know up at home, some citizen science that you can get involved in, and subjects that you can do at home as well. The first pollinator fact, this one is that the white world lemur is the world's largest pollinator. This guy does that. He gets the next all over his face and the the nectar 
the pollen and there's no on the others and that's how he gets those pollinated. The next uh, uh, fact that we have is that it wasn't a Another fact is that the tiny midge is the only pollinator who serves the cacao plant. And the last one I have for you is that butterflies taste with their feet. When monarchs land on milkweed, they use their sensory organs on their feet and heads to let them know that it is a milkweed. So pollination is required for most of the fruits and vegetables that we eat. And pollinators are also essential to the majority of the flowering plants in our environment. And it's also estimated that pollinators are responsible for one out of every three bites of food that we eat. So according to the US Fish and Wildlife Services, there are more than 100,000 different animal species that play roles in pollinating the 250,000 kinds of flowering plants. So uh, we're not going to be able to talk about all those. So we're going to be talking about the most common pollinators that we see, which are the insects, which are bees, wasps, moths, butterflies, and beetles. And we're also going to talk about hummingbirds. They are key in wildflower pollination in the United States. So what do pollinators need? They need nectar and pollen sources. They also need water sources shelter, and reduced pesticide use. So what can you do at home to support pollinators? One thing you can do is you can start a garden. So if you're gonna start from scratch, we have some tips. If, you, um, if you're brand new to gardening, you should really just start small and then add in more plant consequences. Uh, one of your considerations should be um, how much space do you have? Uh, and then the next one would be to think about how much space each plant will need because plants need room. Some of them can get really big. The next thing you should think about is what kind of light do you have? Because this will determine the kind of plants that you should plant. Um, it depends on if you have a uh, full sun um, versus shade versus half and half. Uh, the next thing you should think about is also, do you have a site or a dry site? Because that can determine what kind of plants you want to plant. The uh, next thing you should think about is you should always soil test. Um, you can always contact uh, the Champaign County Extension Office and they can tell you where you can go and get your soil tested. Uh, the next thing you should think about would be planning. You should want to get the for the location that you have. Another thing to consider is when to plant. It's important to note that plants have different planting time requirements. So you need to make sure you find out about the requirements for the plants that you have picked out. For example, some plants may need to be planted in the fall. And then if, also if you're using seeds, some may require scarification or stratification. Scarification is when you, you kind of scrape up the seed to kind of break that uh, coat, the seed coat on it to let it pollinate. Or if uh, you, the, your seeds require stratification, that means you're going to need to, uh, those seeds are going to need a, a period of time in the cold. So you may need to leave the refrigerator for a period of a few months at a time. So after that, the next thing you want to think about is you want to get rid of these your garden. Uh, the best thing I can recommend is to research online to find a way that best suits you because you can could use plastic, um, you could set plastic down to kind of kill off the weeds and the grass, but um, you may want to use cardboard or you may use some kind of chemical for that. That all depends upon how you. Uh, the next thing you want to do is improve your soil. So that soil test that you got, it'll tell you what kind of soil, if, if your soil could use any kind of amendments and what it might need. So if you need any kind of help in interpreting the results from soil, you can call your local extension office and they can help you interpret that. And a point to make is um, the great thing about using native plants is that they don't need any soil amendments. They just grow in any kind of soil um, because they're adapted 
adapted to the soil. If you use native plants in your area, they're adapted to that kind of soil. So that's the great thing about, about using native plants. So the next thing you wanna think about is your garden design. You wanna make a base plan. And um, I also included um, some resources. They're uh, mostly for um, Illinois, um, but um, I have resources that you guys can take a look at and um, see if you can, uh, I think I put on there a garden design area where you can uh, look at the website and it tells you how you can make a, a basic plan for your garden. And the last thing that you wanna do is go ahead and plant. So now we're gonna talk about the kind of pollinators that might um, come visit your garden. Um, it's kind of important to know uh, kind of a little bit about the pollinators. It'll help you to decide what kind of projects that you'd like to do at home. So for bees, bees need lots of pollen and nectar from a variety of plants to feed them themselves and they're young. Uh, they are also attracted to yellow, white, or blue flowers. They uh, are attracted to yellow flowers to have a form and a landing platform. Uh, they're also attracted to flowers with lots of nectar. And they also like, like uh, nectar guides when the nectar guides are present on the flower. And nectar guides are, if you can see these right here in the picture, there's these lines in this flower. They're kind of like an airport runway that tell the bee, hey, come up in this way. You come on in here and there's some nectar inside this flower for you. Uh, another group of pollinators are the flies, and they are considered to be the second most important group of pollinators after bees. Uh, not only do the flies pollinate, they also provide pest control and they are good decomposers. So the most important fly pollinators are surfid flies, and there's a picture of one right here in the corner. Uh, these, are, these guys are often mistaken for bees. Um, but there are some differences. I believe bees have wings and this guy, these guys only have one set. So uh, these guys, uh, flies are attracted to flat topped flowers that are yellow or white. The next group of pollinators are beetles. Uh, a lot of people don't really like beetles um, because uh, they do, they are considered the mess and soil pollinators, uh, but they are the, the predominant group of pollinators since very early times in the evolution of plants. Uh, however, they are considered the mess and soil pollinators. They eat through petals and other flower parts in order to get to the nectar, uh, but they are the guys that typically eat through your plants. <laughs> uh, beetles make up the largest pollinating animals because of their large numbers and are the most diverse group of pollinators in the United States. They're also recognized as the primary pollen transporters for plants such as water lilies and magnolias. Beetles use flowers for food and mating as, as well as a place of re residence and they also use it as a to prey on other insects like aphids. So that's how they're, they're helpful in um, insect control. They like uh, strongly scented flowers that are spicy, sweet, or fermented scented, attracted to open bowl-shaped flowers that are dull in color. The uh, next group of pollinators that we're going to talk about are moths. Uh, recent research has shown that moths may play a larger role in pollination because they're better at it than they were it was previously thought. And that would be because they have those hairy underbellies. They, uh, that hair will help to carry the pollen from plant to plant. Um, so moths that are nocturnal they're important for those night blooming plants and those nocturnal flowers tend to be white or pale in color uh, to reflect the moonlight and that in turn attracts those nocturnal pollinators. The next group of pollinators are butterflies. So butterflies have four life stages, the egg, the caterpillar, the pupa, and the adult. And all of those stages have differing habitat needs. Uh, so larval host plants, which are plants that meet the dietary needs of a larvae, can provide the caterpillar with food and shelter, and they can be specific, like the monarch butterflies preferring milkweed. Um, the butterflies are attracted to bright, colored, narrow, tubular flowers, and they need those landing platforms in order to hang on to the, the flower. I want to talk about... Um, 
Oh, hummingbirds. Uh, hummingbirds, their ne the nectar is 90% of the hummingbird's diet. They need to eat every 10 to 15 minutes, so they're attracted to funnel or cup-shaped flowers. They like strong perch supports, and they like brightly colored flowers with lots of nectar. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about what to plant, but first thing um, you should something something to think about is that um, each pollinator has its own way of getting nectar and pollen. So those flowers that you choose for your garden, they should be very varied as the pollinators that come. Uh, generalist pollinators, those guys can visit a wide variety of flowers, and specialist pollinators, they need a very different kind of a diet and may only be able to feed from one or two kinds of plants. So um, a suggestion would be to try adding plants with large compound inflorescence, inflorescences, such as snow pies, golden rods, and milkweeds to attract the most diverse group of pollinators. So um, some uh, category of plants that you can plant would be to go native. Those native plants, they support native insects. Native plants, they're well adapted to that surrounding environment and support many pollinators. They require less maintenance. They don't need soil amendments or fertilizers. They have extensive roots that allow them to survive drought. While they're not completely free of potential pest damage, they're, that pest damage is often easier to manage. And also, if the native plants become unruly, you can always cut them down to the ground to rejuvenate for next year. Another category that you can plant would be perennials and biennials. An important thing to note is that you should try to choose plants that bloom spring, summer, and fall, so the pollinators have something to eat or to um, rest in all year long. And there's many to choose from, such as aster, golden alexander, lobelia, blazing star, coneflower, black-eyed susan, and goldenrod. Another group that you can uh, plant would be annuals. And some examples would be sunflower, snapdragon, zinnia, verbena, alyssum, and Mexican sunflower. Another category that you could plant would be native trees and shrubs. Some examples of trees would be maples, cottonwood, hickory trees, oaks, and birch. And some examples of small trees and shrubs would be New Jersey tea, service berry, roses, blackberries, dogwoods, red bud, and button bush. And fall time is a good time to plant those trees. Herbs, um, parsley, parsley, and more parsley. And the reason why I say that is because parsley is a of the larvae of the eastern black swallowtail butterfly. And those guys will eat a lot of your parsley. So um, if you like parsley, I, it's recommended you should try to plant some for you and some for them. <laughs> some other plants or herbs that you can plant would be dill, fennel, lavender, and rosemary. Some prairie grasses that you could potentially grow or plant would be um, big blue stem, little blue stem, prairie drop seed, and switchgrass. So what else do pollinators need? They need water sources. They require water for a lot of things such as reproduction and drinking. You could add a bird bath, a puddling area for butterflies, a dripping bottle, much like a one you would put in a hamster cage. Um, you could also put in a, just a container of water, but you wanna put rocks in for a perch. Uh, or if you have the money, you could install a water garden uh, one thing to note would be you want to make sure that you keep those water sources clean and dump them out every at least every two days to make sure those mosquitoes don't breed. And this is an example of a butterfly puddler. Um, they took a bird bath. There's sand in the, in the bottom, and then um, there is water in there, and then they put rocks in for perches so uh, they can land on there and then drink the water. And uh, um, really, actually, butterflies, they even just like just a mud puddle, for example. Um, you don't have to go to this much work, but um, 
uh, that's something that you could potentially do at home. So another thing that those uh, pollinators are gonna need are shelter and, and um, nesting bees like uh, that bare ground. So if you, if you plant, or you do a lot of gardening, uh, try not to mulch too much um, because uh, it's harder for those bees to get into the ground so they could uh, nest in there. Um, so uh, I believe like colettes and mining bees like to do that. Um, another thing would be you could leave like uh, dead wood in your yard. Um, not, it, it, this is just an example, not, it's not something like this big, um, but it's just like some dead branches or something because uh, carpenter bees like to nest in those. Um, some, some of those bees, such as uh, leaf cutter bees, mason bees, and yellow faced bees, they like to nest in the pith of stems and twigs. So in the fall, it's really important that if you can leave plants and debris in your garden over the winter because it serves as a safe place for those pollinators. Um, when it comes springtime, uh, you wanna wait to clean that up until the, those daytime temperatures are consistently about 50 degrees Fahrenheit for at least seven consecutive days. And those perennials and grasses left standing that will provide shelter and will give winter interest to your garden, much like this picture. So on the use of pesticides, um, you really, uh, a way to kind of help uh, keep uh, your, those pests under control is you really wanna check your plants regularly before the pests become a problem. If they do, you can usually take a hose and with a strong jet of uh, water and just knock them off by with the spray. Um, or if uh, they become too much of a problem, you could try picking them off by hand and then drop them in a dish of soapy water. It's always nice to get those Japanese beetles off your plants and just toss them in that bowl full of water. <laughs> um, it's important because most pests are pollinators. So you really wanna to try to minimize your pesticide use. Um, you, wanna, you can apply pesticides if you really feel like you have to, only when needed and really read and follow all the label information. Some labels limit at bloom applications to things when bees are not actively visiting, like late at night in the evening. Um, another thing you can do regarding pesticides, you can learn about integrated pest management. Um, it's also called IPM. It's um, an effective and environmentally sensitive approach to pest management based on a combination of common sense practices. Uh, I think I uh, added a link to a handout in the resources on um, the be uh, basic beginners of IPM. So if you wanna read up on that, you could read that. So um, what else could you do? Uh, there's projects that you could do at home such as you could plant containers for pollinators. So if you don't have a room to plant the garden, you can plant pots for pollinators and any container that holds water. And uh, one important thing to remember is that those plants will grow, so you need to get them. And you always wanna make sure the container has drainage holes. You could place one plant per container or you could combine several for a larger display. You try cosmos, catmint, cranesbill, coneflower, shasta daisy, lamb's ears, and wild marjoram for some for example. Or you can also try to research others to try in your container. Uh, this was something I found I thought was pretty interesting. Um, you could go to um, pollinator.org uh, slash window box. Here you can create your own personal virtual window box. You get to choose the native plants based on your region, and then you can plant them in your own virtual uh, window box. And then when you're done, you can share it on social media, and then you can take all those uh, plants that you chose for your window box, and you can actually go and plant your own actual window box instead of it being just virtual. Another thing you could do would be to um, hang up a hummingbird feeder for the hummingbirds. Um, you could choose one, uh, those purchased ones that you see at the store, they work, they do work fine. 
Um, you can make one, of course, uh, but you want to, if you purchase one, you want to consider one with the bee or wasp guards. Those were those little yellow um, meshy things you see in the middle there. Um, you can make your own nectar. A good recipe would be a mixture of four parts water to one part fine sugar. And there's no need to add the red food coloring to the nectar. Uh, it turns out that have shown that the red dye, it stays in hummingbird system long, long past when the nectar has been metabolized. And it's also unknown what kind of impact large amounts of artificial dyes have on hummingbirds. So it's good to just kind of refrain from using the red dye. Um, you want to replace that nectar every three to five days. And uh, when you replace it, you want to clean your hummingbird feeder with nice soapy water before you add uh, So just try to have your hummingbird feeder placed by mid-April. Another thing you could do is just not mow as much. <laughs> uh, it might be hard for some people. Um, you could, two potential options, you could convert part of your existing lawn with liriope or creeping thyme. Both of those can be mowed to keep it in check because they do, they will, if you don't, they will grow kind of out of control. But these are very good at about being mowed over and it works really pretty well. Uh, another thing you could do would be to let your existing lawn grow a little taller or to allow those dandelions, the white clover, and the violets grow. Uh, those are very good for the pollinators. They're very much attracted to them. Another thing you could do would be to build a, uh, build a house for them, a bee house. There's lots of uh, bee house plants on the internet, and I've added some of those to the resources that I've, I've uh, given you. Um, you could get as enthusiastic as some of these. These are pretty interesting. I've seen some on the internet that are much larger than this, um, but this would be this would be a good size if you wanted to get into something like this. Um, it could be something like this, or you could even go as simple as just taking a can and a bundle of bamboo and just sticking the bamboo inside the can, and then you can hang that. Um, so there's lots of things that you do. If you want to get fancy and do something like that, that'd be great. Um, or even and look into some of those other uh, planter net that are much larger if you want to get into that. But um, that's pretty interesting. Another thing you could do um, if you have, a, if you want just a small kind of garden for your yard, you could plant a pollinator pocket. You could go to the um, extension website here and go to this link here. Um, it has uh, designs for a uh, five by five foot space. It has many options for uh, sun, shade, and, and moisture, as well as a uh, list for plants. And if you really want to, you can get your pollinator pocket registered. A really important thing you could do is plant milkweed. Um, I found this, this uh, statistic. Um, from, I believe it's 2020, uh, the yearly count of monarchs has decreased by 53% this past year. That was um, kind of heartbreaking to, to read. But um, you, we can all help the monarchs by planting milkweed. Uh, the milkweed is the only food source for monarch caterpillars. Monarchs really prefer swamp milkweed, butterfly weed, common milkweed, and prairie milkweed. One fun thing you could do as well is um, get yourself involved in one of the citizen science projects um, that are around. Um, there you can go to these websites and uh, they will give you directions on what you can do and how you can get involved. And um, it's, I, I, I think my family and I, we uh, participated in a little bit of I Pollinate last summer. Um, they gave us a list of plants that they wanted us to plant and the way they, the plant that they wanted it done in. And what we did was just we went out there once a month at uh, the same week for three months in a, a row and we just counted how many pollinators we saw on each of the flowers. And then we just turned in our um what we, we are what we found and it was a lot. So I'm going to see if you can find in your area or if you're in Illinois these uh these websites. There's it's a fun 
that helps out a lot. So I have some tips for you, um, especially for those pollinator gardens. If you do put in a, a water, if you want to do put in a pollinator garden, you want to water that uh, garden for at least the first three weeks. And uh, most small to medium yards, they usually have about 12 to 15 or so well chosen species. So you don't have to get into huge amounts of plants. And uh, when you plant, you want to plant those species in groupings of at least three plants for efficient foraging because it's easier for the pollinators to come and they don't have to fly as far. Um, another tip would be to mix native and non-native plants. Different flowers attract different pollinators in flower shape, size, color, and arrangement aid in attracting those pollinators. You want to avoid the hybrid flowers, especially those labeled double flowers. Those are really much harder for those pollinators to get into. Make sure that you have species that bloom at different times through spring, summer, and fall. And try not to use them so they can nest. You want to use low growing plants for the front yard and under windows. And try to set your mower blade higher to let those violets, dandelions, and clover to flower. And it's kind of hard for some people, but you want to try to be okay with some plant damage. Some of those um, stages that uh, pollinators go through, they need to eat the vegetation. So you can always try to, when you go to design, you can always try to take those plants and put them at the back of the garden. And um, another tip would be to try to learn as much as you can about pollinators. There's, there's so much research going on, um, so much more for us all to learn about. And then another tip would be be creative and have fun with it. And the last thing is just really enjoy it. So. All right. Hey, Jill, can you hear me? See me? Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. yeah. Um, there, there may be about what seems like maybe like a four or five second lag between uh, you and I hearing each other. So folks out there watching, just bear with us here. But uh, that was great. You know, we saw, um, uh, we got those technical difficulties out of the way. Um, but uh, yeah, we were able to see and hear your presentation and it was great. And thanks for all that information. And I also, I uh, wanted to thank you for the, the resources that you provided. Um, uh, folks that are watching, uh, I shared a document that Jill wanted to share with you all with tons and tons of great resources Good. and websites um, uh, for you to visit. Um, that's in the comment section. You should be able to click that link and it'll take you to that resources document. Um, uh, and yeah, uh, and also, you know, you talked a lot about milkweed um, at Champaign County Forest Preserve District, if you're local, um, for example, at the Museum of the Grand Prairie and Homer Lake Interpretive Center, we have free packets of milkweed at our front desks uh, to give away to visitors to encourage folks uh, to, to plant um, uh, common milkweed uh, in their yards. It's just a variety of seeds that we give out um, uh, to help bring, uh, you know, those monarch butterflies back. Um, so if you're in the area, stop by Museum of the Grand Prairie, Homer Lake Interpretive Center, uh, pick up those milkweed seed packets, make your own little, you know, uh, milkweed pocket in your yard, like Jill was talking about. Um, Jill, if you don't mind, uh, I was wondering if we could take um, a few questions um, here at the end. Got some questions coming in, but we may not be able to answer all of them. Um, uh, I saw uh, a couple people asking about um, aphids. Um, I was wondering, Jill, if you had any idea, uh, Diane's asking, she's got aphids on her milkweed, but she wants to figure out how to take care of them without harming the monarch butterflies. Do you have any ideas or anything? You know, I know you shared some ideas of getting rid of some pests safely. Um, any ideas for dealing with those aphids on, make, on, on milkweed without hurting those monarchs? you could I would be to try to plant some, some other 
I plan around that would maybe attract predators. See if that could help. Okay. Jill, you were kind of cutting in in and out there, um, but uh, you were suggesting maybe planting some other plants around it that may attract the aphids away from the milkweed. Is that what you were saying? Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Um, um, uh, I got some other questions coming in. I'm going to try to answer those. So just to clarify the answer on the aphids, Jill was saying maybe plant um, uh, different plants around the milkweed that could mm -hmm. attract aphids um, and, 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 and get them off the milkweed, Diane and other folks who are asking about um, that particular uh, topic. Um, Lena's asking, when is the best time to put plants out for butterflies? Do you have any suggestions uh, for that? I mean, are we, are we getting close to that time, Jill, do you think, or what do you think? Um, you wanna do your research on um, what type of uh, plants uh, attract butterflies. So um, there's lots of resources, like uh, lots of uh, lists on the websites that I gave you. Um, you can try looking at them and trying to see what time of the year it's best to plant those. Uh, that would be my best suggestion. Gotcha. Um, I had some folks asking uh, where to pick up the milkweed seed. So if you're local here in East Central Illinois, um, uh, here in, in, in Champaign County at uh, the Museum of the Grand Prairie, which is located in Muhammad, Illinois, um, at Lake of the Woods Forest Preserve, you can come to the front desk and we've got milkweed seed packets for free. And you can also find those again in Champaign County at another one of our district's forest preserves. At Homer Lake Forest Preserve, there is the Homer Lake Interpretive Center, an educational facility um, uh, within our district that also will provide free uh, milkweed seeds to you. Um, and that is in Homer, Illinois, again, right here in Champaign County. Uh, Mary Jo is asking, uh, what type of milkweed is best for uh, monarchs? Any, any, any recommendations? Do you think there, you know, are there a couple good ones? Jill? Um, let's see here. I had, let me see if I put that. Um, I can recommend uh, swamp milkweed, uh, butterfly weed, common milkweed, and prairie milkweed. Okay. Yeah, so a handful of those milkweeds, um, you know, readily available milkweeds, at least here in central Illinois, should be should be good good attractors of uh, uh, monarchs with, with that milkweed. All right, let's see here. Um, so Judy was asking, so, so you mentioned, um, Jill, to water um, these plants, your pollinator gardens, during the um, uh, first three weeks of putting them out. Uh, how often would you suggest to water during those three weeks? Is this something you do every day? Do you recommend a certain amount of inches of water or, or, or any other recommendations for watering during the first three weeks of a pollinator garden? Um, definitely, probably, uh, I would check them daily just to see, but definitely uh, a little bit of water each day for three, the first three weeks, 
maybe about a half inch or so um, just to make sure get them established and then after that they do really well on their own after that they're really good they're drought tolerant um, the native plants are just wonderful yeah I know I've noticed you know a lot of these native plants have grown you know for you know being used to uh, the prairie life here in uh, central Illinois, here in the Midwest, um, once they're established, like you said, they become pretty hardy, um, uh, and you know they can they can survive quite a bit. Um, they've gotten used to the uh, surroundings that they grow in, but uh, yeah, so just got to get them established those first couple weeks. Um, I think that may be all the time that we have uh, for. Right. For, uh, for tonight's program. Uh, I appreciate it, Jill. Um, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, providing this program for us, this presentation. I want to thank all of you for watching. Again, uh, in the comment section, I provided a link to a resources page that Jill has provided with tons and tons of resources for you to check out, great websites uh, for you to look at if you're interested in growing a pollinator garden of your own. Uh, we encourage you to uh, tune in uh, next month um, to our, our uh, next Garden Speaker Series program again on Thursday, April 22nd, um, uh, where we will have another master gardener, MJ Oviat, is going to present a program, How to Start Your Own Tea Garden, again, live on the Museum of the Grand Prairie Facebook and YouTube pages. Uh, so with that, until next time, thank you all again for watching and enjoy the rest of your evening. I'm going to end the live broadcast. Thank you so much. Hope you will join us again next week for more local